Introductions in a minute, but I always love to get a sense of the audience before we even tell you who the heck we are. So if you don't mind, who here has used ChatGPT? Specifically, Chat okay, one or two of you. Excellent. How many of you use Chat <laughs> How many of you use ChatGPT for? Yeah, less hand. Yeah, I got the subscription model for that going on a lot more. All right. How many have used it for programming? Excellent. How many have used it for research? How many have used it to run your DD game? Wow, this is looking better and better. I'm not going to ask about the porn side. We'll leave the ghost stepping out of this one. Uh, but how many of you are professionally involved in what we now consider AI? I've been an AI designer forever, but different thing now. All right, excellent. Love seeing that. Love seeing that. <laughs> seeing some familiar faces there with this. All right, we will go to questions through this, but we're going to do a little bit of panel first and then open up the, the floor. My name is Andrew Greenberg. I've been a game developer since 1990. First game was a tabletop called Vampire the Masquerade. But since then, I, thank you. Since then, I've gone into computer game dev and I've actually been an AI designer, a very different form than what we're doing uh, now. I... Uh, and the executive director of the Georgia Game Developers Association, a lot of AI folks there, and I recently started a business accelerator called Game Tech Hub for companies who are making technology for the video game industry. We're investing anywhere from twenty-five to 500000 in these startups. We've got a number of AI companies coming through that. So looking forward to this conversation. Hi, everybody. I'm Luca Grippa. I'm a software engineer and researcher at Coalition, where we sell cyber insurance. Uh, I spend most of my time analyzing new vulnerabilities that come out to see how they'll affect our policyholders. And I've also been using large language models to build different uh, insurance applications and see how we can kind of push the limits. So, yeah. This is also my first Dragon Con. Super Yay! Exciting. Bring the panelists a shot. <laughs> Uh, I'm Meredith Rose. I'm Senior Policy Counsel at an organization called Public Knowledge. We are a Washington, D.C.-based consumer advocacy group working on a broad swath of tech policy issues. Uh, net neutralities are one of our banner items, so we do privacy, competition, antitrust. Uh, I head up our copyright portfolio. Uh, ergo, I was the unlucky sucker who was uh, dragged into dealing with artificial intelligence uh, because mm. the very first thing that really exploded under the public consciousness in D.C. was uh, the fake Drake song. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and as the t the like uh, unwilling music licensing expert, uh, this became my beat. Uh, and so you may have seen me uh, quoted. There was a Wired article about character.ai that came out a few days ago. I was quoted in that. I can't stop playing with it. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, it's uh, everyone in D.C. needs to know about AI right now. That's why I'm here. I am Jim Nettles. The answer you're going to hear a lot of is, and some other things too. Um, I am a science fiction fantasy horror writer. I do a lot of stuff in that space. I'm also a nonfiction writer, privacy, data security, business, all sorts of fun things. I do a lot of consulting work across a variety of business and technology industries. Um, professionally, I have been in tech for about 35 years. I've worked with various forms of AI and business intelligence for 30 of that. I've worked with generative technologies for about 15 years in different ways. Um, most currently, um, I'm a partner in, and we've started an AI gaming company. Uh, we are partnered with and doing work with several other companies that are starting to use some of our work as SaaS products. Um, and you're going to hear me argue both sides of this because there's the part of me that's the writer going, throw the damn thing out the window, <laughs> and the other part of me that's leveraging the technologies for what it's used for. And this is, for the shameless plug, um, the second edition of the business book for writers and creatives, um, the main driver for this was putting out a chapter on generative AI technologies. Hi, uh, my name is Bill Buddington slash Captain Pike, if you have Strange New Worlds. Um, I uh, am a uh, senior staff technologist at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, where we uh, work on privacy and security uh, for the public interest. Uh, worked on projects like uh, HTTPS Everywhere, browser extension that uh, keeps your communications safe. Uh, although uh, I have not worked uh, on generative AI in my professional capacity, I have used it. I'm a heron gone bard in D&D, uh, and I myself am not a songwriter, so... Uh, ChatGPT has been very generous uh, with its <laughs> cycles uh, in uh, writing some nice uh, 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 bunny creature songs, uh, you know, uh, for for my D and D campaign. Um, 
Uh, otherwise, uh, yeah, excited that you all are here. Um, uh, and uh, I, we have a little uh, EFF badges if anyone wants to take them. Yay! Like, I'll yeah. take one. I'll take yeah, one. Absolutely. Pass it down. Totally. Um, good morning again. Uh, my name is Amy Stepanovich, and I'm a Dragon Con alcoholic. <laughs> I feel like that's how I need to introduce myself at this point. The first step is to admit you have a problem. I, amen. <laughs> um, this is the third role that I'm getting to introduce myself in as a Dragon Con panelist, which seems really weird and strange. I am the now the Vice President for U.S. Policy at the Future Privacy Forum, which is a global community of people who you might guess um, think about issues around privacy, um, both vis-a-vis -vis, um, both vis-a-vis -vis, um, mobility and location, ad tracking, um, artificial intelligence, kind of the range of technologies um, that collect and use data, of which basically that includes everything today, um, including most washers and dryers. I just bought a place <laughs> and trying to find a washer and dryer that wouldn't collect data was mm -hmm. took way too long. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I'm excited to be here with you all today. Um, we at FPF have done a number of things on generative AI technologies, but most recently, um, and I have it pulled up in front of me just in case I need to reference back, we developed a checklist for organizations who are looking to have institutional policies about their staff using generative AI in various capacities um, and what needs to be put into place before you want to green light anybody um, who works at your office, store, building, community, et cetera, um, to use these tools because we think they probably hold a lot of promise um, and a lot of different things that we haven't even thought of yet, but definitely need to come with safeguards and warnings. Um, and you don't necessarily want people making up fake legal cases if they're lawyers and <laughs> quoting them to courts because you will get in trouble if you do that. Um, Okay, back to back to the other side, I think. Beautiful, beautiful, great stuff. All right, so we're going to start this with the nice side of it. And the first question is going to be, what's the best thing you've seen come out of ChatGPT? Uh, and I know that everybody here is interested in things other than ChatGPT. There's a lot of other things going around. But I think since the title of this is ChatGPT, we'll focus there. So the best thing you've done with or seen with ChatGPT, and I will start in uh, my last Accelerator cohort, there's a group Sage VR that is creating uh, older versions of yourself that you can talk to for therapeutic purposes. And in concepting it, they use ChatGPT to generate the dialogue. Now they're doing their own LLM to create something that can actually be usable, but to show that you could have these conversations, it's been proven that people uh, who are having um, issues with uh, depression, emotions, et cetera, often have a hard time even visualizing themselves older. And there is a form of therapy who just talk to an older version of yourself. And it was very nice seeing them use ChatGPT to show that there was a benefit to this, and then they could go and work on something more effective. I can talk about something cool that we're working on at Coalition. We are actually trying to build a virtual CISO so that every single one of our policyholders, which are mostly small businesses, will have their own um, CISO that they can talk to and get security recommendations and advice. And this. It's, it's been proving to be a challenge, but it's definitely something that's going to be really interesting going forward, giving access to the internet and different documentation for software, as well as, you know, new vulnerabilities are constantly coming out. So keeping it up to date is something that's uh, tricky. Uh, so I will say, actually, my favorite thing to come out of ChatGPT predates four, um, ironically, which was Janelle Shane's work on uh, uh, AI weirdness, um, which if you followed her blog, she also published a book called You Look Like a Thing and I Love You. Um, and her entire thing was she would use earlier iterate, I think it was like GPT-2 and like oh, one, wow. it was the really early versions, but she got access to them as a researcher and just kind of, you know, was trying to prove explain to people who didn't have access to these models like what their limitations were, kind of how they worked. Um, and so she would do things like have it named guinea pigs. So like a local guinea pig rescue contact her and we're like, can you use an AI to name our guinea pigs? <laughs> and so she generated, and there's like Fleury um, was one, of, and it was all these like weird made up colors. Um, and at one point she tried to get it to generate pickup lines, which is where, which is where you look like a thing and I love you came from. Um, 
<laughs> highly recommend her book. It is fantastic. Um, you know, obviously it feels kind of a little bit dated now that we're all looking at GPT-4 and we're like, oh, this is actually a convincing mm-hmm. bit of, of conversation that you can sort of carry out with this. But it is good to kind of step back and say, like, this is fundamentally when you strip away the layers of sophistication, this is what this tool does. And this is kind of how it operates. And you can see the gears turning. I'm thinking that needs to be next year's EFF badge. You look like a thing, and I think I love you. Uh, so one of the there's two things I'll mention. The first of which is we have a project we're doing right now um, where we will be able to create um, AI mentors and educators, so that you will have basically a tutor that can grow with you. You will they will look like someone you're comfortable with. They will be able to use language that adapts to how you learn, how you speak, how you talk, how you're comfortable. Um, and what we can do with these adaptive technologies means that we can actually stretch across the boundaries of learning, everything from about three years old to adult learning and training in corporate environments. And we're working on that project right now. But one of the other fun things that we did, because when we were in playing around with version two and got to playing with it, started being, um, how could we trigger it to have a hallucination and see how much fun we could play with? And so we got it to create a story of existential dread inspired by Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> and we might have had a little bit too much fun with that. <laughs> Isn't that just all of Eeyore's dialogue? Yeah. yeah. I will not tell you where the honeypot got stuck. Uh, no! <laughs> If okay. it is a good day, I <laughs> doubt it. Um, yeah, there's a, a few examples. One, I will brazenly break the rules and uh, you have an example of uh, Dali uh, where you generate this beautiful artwork um, which has embedded in it a fully scannable QR code. Um, so QR codes are... Uh, uh, redundant in some way. There's a uh, data redundancy built into QR codes, so you can have some distortion of the QR code and it still be scannable. Um, so uh, Dali created just magical, mystical, realist kind of artwork over QR codes that that's really beautiful. Uh, that's one I appreciated. Not a chat cha- GPT example, but uh, one thing that is is um, just boilerplate code so that you can. Uh, you know, create a uh, framework for for something, and then get all the the boilerplate out of the way before actually getting to the substantive stuff that you actually want to program, instead of the things that are repetitive and annoying to, to program. So that's one I really appreciate about ChatGPT. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm going to talk about one that I've seen and one that I'm very excited to see and is clearly in development right now. Um, the first thing is, how many of you have people who report to you and you manage in some capacity? Okay, so you're, you're all going to feel my pain when I say I have to have a lot of people create annual plans for the year of their goals and their strategies and their tactics and a lot of people who've never done that before. And one of my team members who was particularly confused about this process and didn't know what to do asked, I don't think it was ChatGPT, but it was another one of the generative AIs, to write his plan for him. And he didn't submit that. He, he went back and he substantially revised it and rewrote it. But it was one of those things where like, I think for people who are creating new documents, the most painful thing is to stare at the blank page when nothing is on it yet. And it gets so much easier once some text is there and you're starting to fix it and modify it. Um, and I actually think that's one of the most powerful uses of generative AI um, in real life right now is just to get rid of the blank page. Um, I know it's not necessarily as inspiring or wonderful as what everybody else has said, but really, really useful when you're, you're trying to actually create something um, in life. The thing that I'm excited about is, is much more um, in the future, but not much further, is the fact that we're now using generative AI or companies are using generative AI to create um, new and novel experiences for non-player characters in video games um, so that you can have an entire like unique to you conversation and everything feels a little bit more like one of the um, 
choose your own adventure books that some of us liked when we were kids and some of you who are younger probably have never heard of um except in the modern in the modern world like how do you actually choose your own adventure so as somebody who play who is currently playing um what was that that's part of the system we're building right now is exactly that is model. It? Yep. Yeah. I, I'm currently playing um, Tears of the Kingdom and the idea of actually interacting with some of those characters uniquely as standalone beings um, is really fascinating to me. Excellent, excellent. All right, I'm going to do two more questions. I'm going to throw it open to uh, the crowd. Since we just listed our favorite thing, let's list either the worst thing you've seen with ChatGPT or the thing you fear the most out of use of ChatGPT. Oh, I'm starting down on you. Yeah. Oh, me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Other end of the table. Let's go back and awesome. forth. Awesome. Um, I actually, I, I co-wrote with one of my um, colleagues a op-ed in The Hill recently about the use of ChatGPT and generative AI in elections and the ability to write advertisements that are targeted in a specific voice to persuade a very specific audience um, using the language that that audience finds most um, persuasive to get them to vote for candidates or measures. Um, I also think the idea of ge image-based generative AI is going to be weaponized in elections against mostly women and candidates of color and candidates from historically marginalized communities because those are the candidates who have traditionally had um, harassment most vitriolly aimed at them um, to continue to harass them, to create images that are um, not images you would discuss on a, a, a panel at 1 p.m., but maybe at 10 p.m. <laughs> um, and, and that actually really worries me because we have not prepared people to be able to respond to um, misinformation that is built to convince specifically them. And I think that we should have been probably working on that for the last eight years um, instead of some of the things we've been doing. But we're not there yet. And generative AI is going to make it worse. Yeah, similar to that, just adversarial inputs in general. Uh, at DEF CON this year, the hacker conference in Las Vegas, um, there was an AI village uh, which uh, encouraged people to trick the generative models into um, convincing uh, or outputting text which um, says that, for instance, that Elon Musk uh, grew up in the inner city of, uh, of Detroit and uh, is a person of color and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and so adversarial inputs can make, um, make AI models kind of output things that are unexpected. And I think that that can be a real danger uh, when people trust the the outputs that uh, that they're they're using um, that it doesn't go with some measure of you know, human vetting or or vetting from something that you trust. Um, so so uh, yeah, adversarial inputs and adversarial um, you know not only prompts that are adversarial but also training uh, you know tra the training data that, that is adversarial can be shaped to make you know uh, a uh, a rubber duck look like a gun and if it's us use in law enforcement context then that can be something that really uh, uh, you know uh, convinces an AI powered law enforcement uh, uh, tool that someone's carrying a weapon um, instead of a rubber duck so those adversarial inputs uh, really affect the outputs in substantial ways, ways that can uh, ruin people's lives. So we need to be vigilant against that, in my opinion. So the, there's a project I'm involved with right now um, where we are, and this is about white papers and research stuff that like three people will ever actually see. Um, but we've got a paper we're working on, and one of the contributors to it is somebody we have worked with that has been a part of this think tank for longer than I have, somebody we've worked with a lot, and submitted a piece that was, we looked at it and it was like, A, it's factually not correct, and B, I can tell stylistically it was generated from a generative AI. And fundamentally, they tried to deny it, tried to play it off, and fundamentally, this has now destroyed their career. They have been removed from the project, they are being removed from doing any work with all of our partner companies um, and fundamentally they're now blacklisted their career is done um, but my bigger concern when we look at the larger world is the fact of most people are trusting this technology way more than they should and because 
fundamentally, it is boiling everything down to, and this is a very simplistic model, I know, but it's fundamentally boiling it down to a mid-level average. It's a starting point, but it's also creating nothing but bigger and bigger echo chambers. So depending on the guardrails that somebody's putting on the sides of it, and depending on the input it's getting, um, we're actually not seeing these models mature and become better. We're actually starting to see them become factually less accurate because they cannot tell the difference between the fact of somebody fed in sci-fi and somebody fed in, in a scientific article depending on how you flag the data. Um, and so we're seeing the accuracy become less and less. We're seeing the mathematics become less and less accurate. So if you're a developer out there, you're seeing more and more garbage code. Um, and so to me, it's that echo chamber and the data quality is not improving, it's getting worse. So there are two general things, and this is very high level because I'm just trying to sum up. There's a lot of things that I see that are concerning and that worry me. Um, to summarize them very briefly though, the, the two things that concern me the most are one, accountability questions. Um, anybody who's followed the algorithmic justice debates in the last decade, maybe two um you have seen the garbage in garbage out mantra um we have seen algorithms doing all kinds of discriminatory behavior in who they serve ads to for what um in you know how they uh, algorithmic sentencing if you follow the criminal justice context there's all these kinds of ways and we have seen all the ways in which this can and does go wrong um and you're turbocharging this with ai uh and ai from a development perspective often has a bit of a black box problem more so than algorithms and so I am concerned about, you know, when an AI does something that violates someone's civil rights, when you have an AI that makes a rubber duck look like a handgun and somebody gets shot for it, who's responsible for that? We haven't directly settled that yet. Um, there are some common law principles already out there that, you know, but again, we're, we're not far enough down the line that this has actively been litigated yet. And so that is, to some extent, still a bit of an open question. Um, the other thing that concerns me is that I think right now we are having all the wrong conversations on a policy level. Um, there is, an, <laughs> without name checking specific lawmakers, um, there are AI policy discussions going on in Washington, D.C., and the people who are leading them are Elon Musk. Mm -hmm. They are Mark Zuckerberg. They are the folks behind, oh, they're all the big, and they tend to be the sort of AI um, futurist, we're worried about making Skynet types, and they don't want to have the conversations about, we have an AI that's racist. Mm -hmm. We're having an AI, we've developed an AI that is now discriminating against people, that's causing these real, tangible, identifiable, real world harms against real living people right now. Those are not the conversations that are happening. Uh, because, and I, I say this with as someone who reads too much goddamn sci-fi, um, <laughs> these people read too much goddamn sci-fi. Um, and there are mental models for AI are things like Skynet and the Terminator and, uh, you know, uh, the computer from War Games, the name of which is Whopper. Um, You're I, welcome. We're, we're here to make you paranoid. I'm going to turn in my nerd card for not remembering Whopper off the top of my head. Um, but those are the kinds of conversations that are happening right now, are these very big doom and gloom, we're going to get a robot that wipes out humanity or launches our nuclear arsenal, and that is a fine conversation to have so long as you don't have it at the expense of the real ongoing harms that are happening to people right now. And the bigger concerns about things like economic displacement, which is a huge thing in generative AI, and a huge source of concern, especially for creative workers, those conversations aren't happening because all the oxygen is being sucked up by we might create Skynet. Can I actually, real quick, I want to applaud everybody in this room who is at this panel rather than the AI apocalypse panel that is going on at the exact same time. Thank you for coming here um, as a direct response to what you, Meredith just you are, said. You are all smart and discerning and very attractive people. <laughs> You're a thing and I love you. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm real. That's a different debate. Yeah. Um, a one of the yeah. things that's concerning, one of the things that's concerning for me, and kind of similar to what Amy said, is kind of the use of these LMs for malicious content generation. Mm -hmm. I know coming from the cyber insurance world, uh, something that we're starting to see is these bad actors using uh, ChatGPT and large language models to generate phishing emails. When these phishing emails used to be really bad and it was super easy to spot them, that's no longer the case because 
even though they might have bad English, they aren't the ones writing it anymore. So that's definitely something scary. And another thing, um, which I think Meredith kind of just spoke about, is uh, really like the people in control of this technology. Um, you know, like OpenAI and these companies, some of them are already really big, like Google, but uh, they're going to be the ones controlling it. They're going to be the ones that are deciding, okay, what what is okay for this thing to say and what isn't okay. And that's just kind of scary. And we got to like, hopefully there'll be some legislation and things like that that can kind of uh, regulate this, but definitely something to look out for and pay attention to, I think. All right. Yeah, I'm going to build on what Luca just said, which was building on what Meredith just said, which is exactly that walled garden nature of it. Yes, there are open source AI tools t out there. They're going to be a few years behind what the giant companies are doing. And right now we're seeing uh, GPT-4 going more and more towards a subscription model, meaning that we're already seeing this economic disparity between who can and who can't access it. I'm glad to see that some libraries are already paying for access to better tools, but that's not everybody. And these tools are going to become more and more important in our lives. Yes, at some point, we're all going to have our own AI agents, just like we all have our own websites right now. We're not there yet, and the giant ones will continue to get ahead of where we are. We already know that the biggest financial companies have their own AI tools in-house to generate profits for themselves. What ways will that be impacting the economy that we can't deal with? I don't know from my point of perspective, and I can't ask ChatGPT to give me a good answer to that question. So we all will be using AI, every, even the ones in the apocalypse uh, session right now. But who has access to the best tools continues to make that have, have not disparity even more significant. All right, last question before we turn it open to all of you. I see a lot of folks on the edge of their seats already. From everybody on here, one business idea that you will throw out for other people to have, not that you're going to hoard for yourselves, that they could be doing with ChatGPT. I'm asking this question because I went to the CreateX demo day yesterday over at Georgia Tech. That's where about 100 companies get formed, get invested. And there are a bunch of AI companies obviously out there. Well, one was uh, doing ChatGPT to generate fanfic. You type in which, uh, which genre you want. You get your Harry Potter, et cetera. It generates your own fanfic. And I'm, I'm sure they went to more interesting areas with that. But uh, one that really fascinated me was one that is currently using AI to analyze your insurance bill, or not your insurance, but your medical bills, mm -hmm. when you've gotten a medical bill from a hospital and try and figure out what you shouldn't have been charged and what you should have been charged. And I want one that will go ahead and do that for a lot more aspects of my life. That'll go ahead and help me analyze my insurance bill, help me analyze what am I getting right, what's not here, what discounts am I not seeing that I don't have any idea even exist, and so forth. So with that, go build it. Save me a hassle. <laughs> Uh, instead of just the bills, another thing I've seen is looking at the policies, right? So you can kind of explain to this uh, LLM or, or chatbot what you're looking for, and it has already analyzed the insurance policies, and it can tell you which one's kind of right for you. But another thing that I think is cool, and um, I think, James, you said you were working on, like, education with That's kind one of, of large the language models. Doing. So I was recently at DEF CON, and they had a uh, screen on the side that was actually like annotating what people were saying and it was correcting itself so it would annotate and then sometimes not always right and then it would correct itself and I think that would be something that would be really cool for like students to use for note taking so if you're sitting in a lecture right you're take you're recording the audio from the professor and it's taking notes for you or it's like annotating what he's saying but then also now restructuring those notes into something that's digestible and easy for you to remember I think that'd be pretty cool yeah uh, mine's, mine is definitely an, a well-worn idea, but real-time audio translation, just person-to-person -person speaking. Um, I love traveling. I am pretty good with languages. I have forgotten more Japanese than I ever learned, um, yeah. despite having lived there for an entire summer. And just to be able to have something do that real-time translation without having to, you know, and there's some cool apps that will do it right now where you can, you know, do it and then hold up your phone and kind of swap back and forth like that. Um, there was a really interesting demo, actually, um, that I saw a video of where someone is using essentially smart glasses to do live-time closed captioning of conversations that you're having with another person. 
Um, so they're sitting across from you, and it's you know it's a, it's an accessibility tool. Like the the uses of AI for accessibility are just mm -hmm. mind blowing. Like it's incredible, and I think that is genuinely where we're going to see some of the most good come out of these devices is an accessibility, just making the world more accessible for folks with disabilities or um, you know like. A, I have ADHD. Um, if someone could AI some executive function for me, please let me know. Um, it'd make a killing. Uh, but yeah, I think that's like there's going to be some really incredible stuff coming out of this space in the next few years. I need that translator for use with some of my EFF panelists. Um, are you calling me out again? I <laughs> <laughs> Who? Uh, what are you talking about? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And they work with you work with kids who speak a different language, so you can have an actual conversation with it in your ear and it translates for you. Oh, we're in the future. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it's like anything else. When you start looking at starting a business, because I do a lot of consulting for startups. I do everything from startups to on up. Um, but it's what's the problem you need to fix, right? It's what's a problem you're dealing with that you see is everyone is dealing with. And this is where these generative technologies are offering everybody to come up with unique solutions that are going to be much more niche. So in other words, this now makes it cost, uh, as a cost basis, you can create solutions for very niche audiences. So if you've got marginalized communities, if you have got, you're looking at specific communities that are having issues, now these technologies that I've been playing with in a variety of environments for a long time are accessible to everyone. And because of that, that means when you see a problem, you've got an opportunity to fix it. One of those things that I see being a big assistant is actually for people who um, need that personal assistant to help interpret things for them. And this goes across everything from educational levels to um, people of age, people with learning disabilities, people that are, you know, with cognitive problems, where you can have these technologies um, speak to you in a way that you understand, but take notes and keep a history of that. So if you've had a conversation with your doctor, if you've had a conversation with um, somebody else like that, and we're seeing people do this, but I think there's a lot of opportunity for somebody to go out there and create these tools specific for their user communities, their people of need, and fix this problem in a very cost-effective way. Yeah, building on uh, some of the medical application, uh, what I try to do just by myself is um, figure out what cognitive biases I have and uh, correct for them uh, in any given situation. And um, I think that it would be great if uh, a uh, generative AI was able to detect cognitive biases in uh, in someone via their prompts and say, "Oh, hey, you." You're a racist, <laughs> um, uh, or you know, uh, hey, you know, you have a confirmation bias that says that uh, Canada. No, I love the achievement uh, generator uh, AI. Lets you know when you're just when you're um, enjoying too much. Uh, uh, why is the word dropping out of my head when I've got too much of my own uh, uh, advantage in life? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's my privilege. It's like the <laughs> most great. cursed clippy. It's like, hey, I see you're being racist. Just <laughs> <laughs> uh, going on blue sky. <laughs> yeah. Or think that like you know Canada is the best, or the, or people that think that um you know um, Enterprise is the best Star Trek series or something like that. But <laughs> clearly, you have a confirmation bias by saying, you know, oh, uh, so you're saying that Enterprise is the best Star Trek? Question mark. Enter. <laughs> Wait a minute, you might have a confirmation bias. We all know what uh, the cartoon series. Yeah. <laughs> the animated series is... There, there's only one cartoon series, okay? It's Lower Decks. <laughs> um, so I think that would be a million-dollar business idea. Um, I'm going to be the, the weird one on the group that says, like, the, the best business idea um, in response to chat deep GPT is to make things that will respond to all of the crap that's that's g-rated right crap <laughs> yeah. that chat gpt is going to create um yeah. artificial intelligence i think is a rule like if you look at the the bell curve it it genericizes things it pushes things into the middle which means automatically anybody who's on the other end of the bell curve is getting left out that is what it is designed to do is push toward the middle um, and so we're going to need a lot of tools that are out there to make sure that um, what is written 
um, made standard or average by artificial intelligence, pushing everybody into the average, actually continues to take account for the ends of the bell curve um, in every situation. So people who are actually responding to Chad GPT by creating things that open things up beyond what is pushed out by artificial intelligence, I think, are going to be um, leagues ahead of the game and are putting out tools that are um, very, very useful in the future. And I will take this opportunity to also plug the 5.30 p.m. panel in this room on accessibility for Ooh. people with disabilities in VR and virtual worlds, which is going to be incredibly connected to this conversation, mm -hmm. even though it's about um, immersive technologies and not necessarily generative AI, because those things are going to go hand in hand. <laughs> All right. Excellent. Excellent. All right. So we are going to open up for questions from you all now. We do have a, a large audience. You will need to line up behind that microphone right there. Please do limit your question to two minutes. We've got a large audience here. We know that your questions will spark more questions. I'm not going to be the you must shut up right now uh, person, but please try and keep it one to two minutes uh, in the question. We do have a lot of folks here. All right. Go out line for me. Take it away. You can take the mic out, too, and hold it. Okay. I was just curious if any of you know about artificial intelligence in being used in risk assessments in the criminal justice system, either for, um, like, bail or supervision level, that sort of thing. And are there any jurisdictions that have completely gone over to using AI for their risk assessments, and how legal is that? I can speak to that a little bit. Uh, I know that, I, I don't know it, it was uh, necessarily AI, but it was machine, a machine learning um, algorithm that was used in risk assessment that, uh, and sentencing guidelines, yeah, and sentencing uh, recommendations. Um, I, I, the example is not, you know, exactly coming to mind, but I know that that is being used in the U.S. Um, and it's scary. It's, you know, uh, relying on... Uh, black box algorithms that you uh, don't have access to and often the people that are sentenced don't have any uh, meaningful appeal in, uh, in saying, hey, what, on what basis are you sentencing me to 26 to life, you know? Um, that, that black box effect that is ingraining uh, in every level of our criminal justice system and that's something that we d we don't, as a society, have insight into how it works, and that's extremely troubling. So this is a good example, and I, I believe, I may be wrong about this, I believe Chicago was flirting with these, these algorithms for a while if they didn't start using them. Um, so to illustrate, for folks who are not super familiar mm -hmm. with these, um, one of the really popular things about probably 2018, 2019, I think is when it started getting a lot more news coverage, um, was essentially these tools, which were algorithmic assessments that makers would pitch to court systems and say, hey, it's really complicated to do a neutral evaluation of someone's flight risk and how much you should make them pay for bail. And it basically like pretrial release was kind of like the big use case. Um, and so they pitched these as being like a purely objective way to assess how much you should set someone's bail at and whether they're a flight risk and yada yada. Um, and, you know, of course, the, their version of neutral is, well, you don't have to input the person's race. You just have to input their zip code. <laughs> and please just disregard the fact that these two things correlate very heavily and also tend to correlate with, you know, communities that are over-policed. Uh, and so have greater like recidivism rates because of over policing, and you know, and so it's this it's this chain of chain of garbage all the way down, and you ended up with these like unreviewable you know determinations that got spit out of a black box. And I know some jurisdictions have dumped them because there was some very, um, I think the Intercept might have been there was some outlet that was like really covering this quite extensively. Um, but yeah, it's it's a great example of just it's a black box. There's no accountability, and it just replicates existing biases through other routes. And, and, oh. and the, go on. Uh, so, so before I was in game development, I was a legal affairs reporter here for the Daily Report. Those of you local or lawyers, I apologize uh, for everyone else. Great paper. But um, even then, there were discussions of using AI a, to eliminate racism, but also just some of the weird biases that judges have. There was a study of judges that showed that uh, de the decisions made before lunch were going to be harsher than ones made after lunch. 
<laughs> so, I mean, there's, there are a lot of different areas where there are un, uh, unacknowledged biases that pop up and all unacknowledged factors that have nothing to do with the person involved. Go ahead, Captain. A uh, book that I can't recommend uh, enough uh, on this very subject is called Weapons of Math Destruction uh, by Kathy O'Neill. Uh, and it talks, it's less on the generative side, um, but more on the machine learning and, and the ways that it wor that works into job application uh, and uh, the way that it feeds into, uh, machine learning feeds into the fact that, um, you know, disproportionately people of color are, and pe poor people and uh, like also are uh, fed uh, uh, ads for no-name universities that charge way more for their advertising than their program. Like uh, these these kind of colleges that aren't going to you know benefit them in life. Uh, these kind of things. Um, uh, the ways that algorithmic bias works into our society in general. Those are. Uh, uh, it's a great book. Again, I'll say, Weapons of Math Destruction, Kathy O'Neill. And the only thing I'd add to that, um, and this goes back to an article I did in about 2018, I'd have to go back and look, was looking at how it, because this is something we haven't talked about, is how these technologies can be used for data analysis that open up data analysis. Uh, in other words, we can do things now along the lines of facial recognition. I can go scan all of your accounts. So if I'm looking at something like judicial evaluation, if I'm looking at your risk level, because again, much of my career is actually in fintech um, and other spaces like this, risk management, moving money, a lot of this sort of stuff. So when you look at all your social media accounts uh, for something like this, you know, for flight risk, bail risk, it can go through. You may not have fed in racial characteristics or other characteristics, but if I'm looking at your social media profile to see, are you putting in things that hint at other behavior, criminal behavior, monitoring for parole systems, I'm mean, sorry, for... Um, um, it's been a long day, um, mm -hmm. but monitoring for different systems for par uh, for people out on parole and things along those lines, we're seeing use of some of those type tools to monitor a lot of different data that typically before there was just too much data to monitor. Now these tools can flag that. All right, go ahead. Okay, uh, I hope this is not too complicated a question. But there are a lot of spaces where we don't want people to use AI chatbots. Huh? You know, academia and in certain kind of jobs. I, I work uh, I work for like an AI company and they don't want you to use AI when you're doing your work. Um, but there are cases that I've come across where people wrote everything by their own selves and it gets flagged as AI because particularly because the AI uh, detectors are universally useless. So how do you think we should handle avoiding false positives when trying to detect AI? I well, like sir, this question. Go ahead. You want to take, go? No, uh, go. I was just going to talk about the academia side. I mean, I uh, work very closely with a lot of academics, and a lot of them are embracing AI as a starting point for the students do and encouraging them to go to ChatGPT and uh, just start there, go ahead and get them to write it, and then you do the real essay that gets turned in later, and they don't mind seeing that, um, that chain of creation. They're admitting it's there and they think that it's a good learning tool. The idea of your personalized tutor, Khan Academy is all over this and it's been very clear mm -hmm. that they're going to be giving you your own tutor so you'll work with it to create all this and the AI will be in, in integral to your uh, educational experience. Um, I don't think we can work it in everywhere but I think that we will see more of that where it becomes incorporated into areas where right now we see it as a, a big negative. Mm -hmm. So I th there are two things here, I think. Um, the first one is, I, I'm going to say testing, but I kind of mean the whole range of trying to rank people in different things. And I think we're going to have to, much like um, with the introduction of calculators way back when, reevaluate how we do all of that. Like I think teaching is at a fundamental point of change um, where systems that we have looked at and relied on and taken for granted to an extent in the past um, are going to have to adapt to a new world and we're going to have to come up with new methods of testing, assessment, teaching that take into account this technology is there and it's not going to not be. We can never assume that things are not going to be used. 
So that I think is a very important piece of this. Um, the last time I was at Dragon Con, I was affiliated with the University of Colorado, and we were doing an internal policy evaluation of how to take into account um, monitoring tools in order to um, do assess, in order to assure that students were not cheating during the pandemic when everybody was taking tests at home. And I had the same response there, which is we need to come up with new methods of assessment um, because you cannot put people into one situation and then tell them not to touch something. Um, it, it doesn't work that way. Um, and surveillance tools only are going to disproportionately impact people who have been taught to suspect surveillance tools of being bad because their whole lives they have been targeted by surveillance and surveillance mm -hmm. tools. Um, the second piece, though, is transparency, which I feel like mm -hmm. is incredibly important. It's one of the things in the checklist I mentioned earlier. Making sure that all of us, when we're using AI, generative AI in our jobs, are indicating, like, I have used this to do X in writing this report, and, like, really making it the standard to say that you have used it. Um, there was a, an ep I haven't watched a new South Park episode in so long, and one of them ended up in front of me on ChatGPT, and I sat and watched it. At the end, there was like, we wrote this using ChatGPT. And I was like, that was really smart. And then they were transparent about it. Like, we didn't write this. We put it into ChatGPT, and they wrote it for us. Everything, I think, needs to come with that. Like, yeah. either we researched this topic originally using generative AI, we wrote this originally using generative AI. You're accountable for what comes out of it. But tell people where you're using the tool because it's out there. It's just a tool, and let's like approach it that way. So there's there's a couple of things I just want to flag on this because just to, to zoom out a little bit, this panel is just about ChatGPT and text-based LLM AI generative things. Um, so the question of detection in the in the absence of disclosure. So like a lot of in the policy sphere, a lot of the discussion right now is about like disinformation and sort of weaponized generative AI, um, and there are different answers, especially around images, images and video specifically. Um, there is, and I just want to flag right now, you know, with text, there kind of is no good way to like, you know, hash or fingerprint output from these, these systems. Um, there are programs right now going on with some of the major image generators where they have, I guess Google has just developed some kind of new hash technology that like is basically very, very resistant to being edited out. So this is a thing that people are looking to address, specific, especially in response to like Congress critters, some of whom are very concerned that they themselves are going to be deep faked. <laughs> um, it's remarkable how uh, they're like, well, what if somebody puts a, a, a Amy Klobuchar? Um, just very concerned someone's going to deep fake her. Uh, and yeah, so there there is technological work being done on this, but text is kind of its own. Yeah, it, you really sort of rely on individual disclosure. Hey. Well, and Amy Klobuchar will be deep. Like, yeah. women and people in color in politics will be deep fake. They will all be Buffy botted, probably by the people who they are um, most scared of and have been traumatized by in the past. Mm -hmm. And I do think, like, we need to prepare for that, for, like, seeing ourselves created in generative AI by the people we trust least, who can then manipulate our generative AI bodies to whatever ends that they want to. That It just terrifies. Like, you hit on a thing hey. that, like, truly terrifies me well and the, the the couple of things because again the deep fakes are a are already a huge problem for scammers for being able to emulate generate do a lot of things but looking there's two things to me that are also really important about looking at institutional controls over using these tools number one is the idea if I have fed proprietary technology into one of these things what has that done to my rights? Because I've now introduced something that's proprietary information into a system I do not own, do not control, and I have just surrendered at least some portion of my rights to that IP. You're fired. You're done. Your career is over. Um, and I, I mean that very intentionally. I have told my teams that if you use these things and anything proprietary goes in, you're done. You're blacklisted. Um, the other part of it I put to it is this, which is that these technologies are designed to work towards the middle of the road. It gives you a starting point. And one of my biggest concerns, going back to the echo chamber, is the idea of destruction of creativity. Because if I get lazy enough, then the way I'm going to know that my high performers are the ones that leverage the tools for what they're good for and then innovate from there and I already see it. 
Yeah, I think um, kind of like Amy said, you know, we, we kind of talk about, um, you know, using this to generate stories and like using it to do all the work for you. But the real value is using this as a tool. I mean, people say, you know, like, I program, right? This is just going to replace all software engineers. They're going to be gone. And not, I, I don't really think that's going to happen. I think the real value is using that to now, like, me be 10 times more productive, right? To start, to not start on the blank page, to get it to write that outline for me, and then I can really get going and fill in the blanks. And, um, yeah, I think that's kind of where the value comes from. And to take the last word on it, when I get applications to the accelerator, I just assume that they've run it through ChatGPT at some point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh yeah, I just want to like ask the create the creatives here on the panel. Kind of, my experience with uh, ChatGPT being creative is not very good. Yeah, like it, it doesn't it's output very good stuff. It's not. It's not great. Yeah. yeah. Um, Four is not a final version. You're gonna. Yeah. Well, I, and I mean, it, so, I mean, talking about what we've been building, if anybody's interested, we've got a beta that's available you guys can play with and see, and we're releasing new stuff all the time. We've done a lot of work to create interactivity. That has been our focus, is to create and emulate that level of dialogue and interactivity and difference between NPC characters. Um, and when we look at that, it's also the same technology we're building and using to train to be able to work in education and communicate and educate because it is building relationships and remembering state data and remembering how you've interacted in the past. We're doing a lot of things to create and emulate basically memory. But again, as a writer, um, there are things that I've talked about and, and come and said, you can use this as a starting point. Like, okay, give me an outline of X. That's no different from, you know, pulling up a plot model, you know, because again, there's only so many storylines. It's how do you get original. The problem is are the people that are flooding the market right now with absolute garbage to the point where if I don't know you as a writer, you're not even going to get considered when you submit a story or submit a piece. All right, we've got 10 more minutes. We'll try and get in as many questions as we can. Those of you who have to run to your next panel, please remember to rate us before you leave this room. Go on the Dragon Con app. Tell them it was incredibly awesome and valuable, and you've got five incredible business ideas. You can be a millionaire and give some of it to Dragon Con Charity. All right, next question. My, uh, my threat in it, um, you know, it, it had been on everybody's mind for the past few months, and it's been frustrating me at the, at the party who love pop culture. Well, how do you guys feel about the writer strike? I mean, right now, um, um, the writers are, are, getting, are getting put in a file, and the large companies like Disney are, are putting these people to hell. I mean, I mean, they told them, you, um, um, we're going to end it if you, when you're homeless, when you don't have a home. And I just feel like right now, um, the company need to, need to wake up and feed them. And how do you guys feel about the virus strike going on in, in Hollywood? So I, um, I actually, part of, one of the things that we realized, so I am one third of the team developing our AI policy because everyone in DC has had to get an AI policy up real fast. Mm. Um, and one of the things that we came to the conclusion pretty early on is it is impossible to talk about AI policy meaningfully without talking about the future of labor. Um, because this is just, it's a motivating concern for most people, and you can't disentangle the two things. Um, there's a couple of interesting things about the writer strike and AI. Um, so for those who do not know, this is a very high level, broad strokes thing. One of the fights between the WGA West and the studios about AI right now is there are different pay scales depending on where in the creative process you operate in a writer's room. If you are doing a first pass of a script, you get paid a higher rate. If you are doing a touch-up of an existing script, you get paid a lower rate, a much lower rate. And so the concern is that, uh, among many, many other concerns, um, is that you know studios are going to try to eliminate that more expensive rate by just having basically LLMs generate the first pass of the script, and they'll only have to hire humans to do the touch-up rate, um, you know, which will basically starve out writers. Um, I think this is really interesting for a lot of reasons. But one of the big ones is that I think organized labor is going to be an enormous check systemically on how these tools get deployed in working environments. 
Um, I think that is the on the ground first line of pushback on most of these things. It is, you know, I, I live and operate in Washington, D.C. I spend a lot of time talking very respectfully and very stressed to uh, staffers of members of Congress about these things. Um, and, you know, it's very easy, I think, to say, like, we need to make big rules about how this works. And we do. We need to make some big rules. But you can't, it's very difficult to make big rules that are going to be effective in every potential use case that these things are going to pop up. And while we are figuring that out, because that is a slow process, I will warn you, members of Congress are just getting the vocabulary now to speak about some of this stuff. Um, I'm totally sincerely, like these are, these, these folks, there are entire major jurisdictional committees who don't have staffers who work on AI policy yet. They just don't. Um, and so until that capacity has developed at the national level, it's going to be unions. It's going to be workers. It's going to be the on the ground labor forces. They're going to be controlling how this gets deployed. And I think the WGA SAG after strike is like a real model for how to push back on those concerns and how to hold the line on them. And also has to be consumers. We've pushed back in the game industry when AI uh, generated images showed up in D and D modules. Mm -hmm. So it's also the consumers. Yep. need to push back and say, we want original creations. I don't hear them Good. doing it, so I'm going to plug the 8.30 p.m. panel on Sunday with three of our Today panelists, James <laughs> Meredith and Andrew, on using LLMs and generative AIs for gaming and creative works, because I feel like this conversation might um, get delved into in much more depth. I don't think I'm on that right, one. Next question. Oh, oh. I will be. <laughs> Oops. So, I am now. <laughs> Welcome. Well. I'm like a vampire. You invited me in. <laughs> I don't think I have that power. <laughs> you had mentioned um, one of the things you saw was AI being used or chat GPT before it being used for therapy. Right. But as far as I know, where we are now, it, it lacks the nuance for emotional right. context and, and just understanding, interpreting emotional responses. Do you think we're close to that with AI being able to provide meaningful therapy? So what I like about Sage VR is that they're dealing with you as the LLM. They're trying to create you. So they're working with you to create a model of yourself that you want to have a conversation with. And so that, that they're not, in the end product's not chat GPT. It's mm -hmm. something unique to you. And I think that's where we're going to have to be with more and more therapeutic tools. I think that at some point, wow, that was weird. Um, I think at some point uh, it will be an effective therapy tool, not as good as a therapist. But if you can't get a therapy appointment for another six months, then you can go into your online therapist and at least get some attention and some focus right then. Um, right now, it's not that I wouldn't use ChatGPT4 as a way to save myself uh, from some downward slope. More like dealing with the acute <clears throat> hotline type stuff. Right, right. At some point, we'll have, we could, I'd love to have my own individual therapist as an AI that I could just talk to about things, period, and that's been trained on me. That would be a useful tool, period, whether I'm going through a depressive episode or anything else. Mm -hmm. I'd love to just have that kind of check-in. But that requires it to be trained on me and not be generic. Yeah, um, and I think this is just worth pointing out that, like, I think this is just to go back to the earlier comment. These things are tools, and I think the important thing right now is being realistic about their use cases in that, like, if, you know... I have CPTSD, I'm not going to go use a, like, that, that's something the degree to which I'm going to need a, an actual human being, um, you know, it, versus if you're dealing with anxiety or, um, you know, I don't want to, like, flatten things and say, like, oh, more generic mental illness, but, like, there are certain degrees of, you need to know, like, if I've got brain cancer, I'm going to go see a brain, <laughs> like, I'm going to go see a real doctor, um, I'm not going to consult WebMD first, um, and being able to, it, like, instill in people there's degrees of where these uses are going to be appropriate and helpful and where they are not going to be and we are not wholesale replacing therapists with them. Okay, uh, next question. Thank you. Do you see any changes in consumer behavior? Uh, because usually us, you know, consumers, we talk a big game about privacy, about who has access to our data, but at the end of the day, we prefer our convenience. Mm -hmm. Do you see anything different now? The, the D and D uh, example is still the best. Put AI uh, images in D and D things, and the fan base just says, "Heck no, don't do that again," and they've promised essentially not to do that again. 
I'm going to object to the premise a little bit. I don't necessarily think people want to give up their privacy. In my experience as somebody who's worked on privacy way too long, people don't generally want to give up their privacy for the convenience, but they feel that they have to. And I think that is the role that policymakers and lawmakers need to play. It's like, I should be able to drive my car without worrying that my engine's going to blow up. I should be able to use my oven without worrying. It's go my house will explode. I should be able to use a generative AI without re thinking that it's going to massively take advantage of me and do the equivalent of blowing up my life. We don't have that third law yet. We don't have the protections in place for that third category yet, but we need to. Um, and if policy and law can't step in and do that, I think we're going to be further and further into dystopian world. And, and the only thing I would add to that about consumer behavior is we want fast and we want cheap and we want original and you can't have all three. It's an iron triangle and this is part of the writer's strike. Some of the stuff we've got going here, the things they want to do. If you want to get more generic crap regurgitated back to you and maybe tweaked out a little, a little bit before it gets acted out, in other words, sitcoms from the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, 2010s, 2020s. If you want to have those regurgitated back to you for the next 20 years, then, you know, keep buying the same crap you've had. If you want real creativity, pay your creators. Just the kind of thinking about the scale and deployability of AI, so general AI systems uh, has, has become much, much less costly in the last three years. Um, you used to ha have to have a Bay Wealth cluster of uh, 100, you know, hundreds of machines in order to deploy a generative AI system. Now you can run it on a, a local laptop, which means that uh, the uh, ability for us to preserve our privacy because the generative AI models are just being run uh, not on a uh, box somewhere in the cloud, but is you know uh, can be run via open source models on a local laptop that you're running yourself um, is, is very feasible. So I think that those that are uh, concerned about their privacy are going to start deploying, it's, the, the, it's going to, the, the deployment of uh, generative AI systems is going to become a lot more streamlined uh, in the near future as well. And that's a good thing for, for privacy. And on that note, we are out of time. Those of you who still have questions, please enter them into your chat GPT bar window on your Windows 11 machine or meet us out in the hall. We will continue pontificating. The rest of you, rate this 